You look down on us and think we are little better than barbarians. But you should be glad that we are, for without us here, the northern tribes would be dining on the flesh of your children in your burning homes. But for the courage that flows in our veins, would your lands be theirs? Look down on us. You should get onto your knees and thank us every day. The Kingdom of Kislev, sometimes known as the Realm of the Ice Queen, is the most northerly human civilization within the Old World, a powerful and war-driven nation that is known far and wide for having some of the greatest horsemen to ever roam the plains of the southern realms. From the World's Edge Mountains to the east and the Sea of Claws in the west, Kislev stands at the very frontiers of human civilization, a land covered in wide-open steppes and thundering icy rivers, where lonely villages stand isolated in the empty wilderness, while mighty cities rise from the landscape like great islands of stone. The climate is harsh and unforgiving, and only the strongest, most determined people can survive here. The inhabitants of Kislev are these very same people, a race of wolf-tough and self-reliant warriors, valiant and determined in the defence of their homeland against the hated marauders of the uppermost north. Ruled by a mighty Tsar, Kislev is a nation born from the saddle, their people's ancestry traced to the mighty horse warriors of the eastern steppes many millennium ago. Since the founding of this mighty kingdom, Kislev has been, since its very creation, under siege by the murderous hordes of chaos undivided, a kingdom that sits forever at the brink of total annihilation. Countless generations of Kislevites have fought, bled and died in the snowy tundra of those harsh northern lands, and it is thanks to these brave Kislevite warriors that the kingdoms of men have managed to flourish in the south, huddled together in their warm and safe homes, while the sons of Kislev fight till they draw their last dying breath. Long ago, many Gospodar clans lived on the endless steppe. Like today, it was a vast province and was lashed with the terrible energies of chaos. The Gospodars were beset by all manner of foul woes, and the demon gods offered surcease from these attacks. If the Gospodars would, but bow their head in worship. But the Gospodors were stubborn. Since before its founding, the people that would found and rule Kislev were the ancient clans of the Gospodor a mighty nomadic people of the eastern steppes and the descendants of the Scythians of old. They lived, drank, loved and died like their forefathers before them, living out their lives in relative peace on the open steppes. All that changed one day when chaos began to flow like water into the harsh lands of the uppermost north, and cold, foul foes and numberless beasts of all kind began to stalk and kill off their people. The mighty Gospodors and their former brethren and neighbours, the Hung and Kurgan, fought on against the will of the Chaos Gods, for no sane human being would give up their soul to damnation. But such a foe could not so easily be stopped, and in time, one by one, their former neighbours were subdued and were enslaved to their worship. Although their brethren were mighty and fierce, they lacked the willpower of the Gospodors to fight on, and so the Gospodors kept on fighting, ever believing in the divinity of their gods and requesting their aid against them. The greatest of their gods, Urson, god of bears and strength, aided his people in their time of need, but even his godly strength and the will of arms that they had proved insufficient, and slowly but surely the Gospodors' plight became desperate. Then a great spirit called the ancient widow, Kislev, or simply the land, 
whispered to a gospador shaman priestess. The spirit promised her great power if she swore to lead her people west, towards a distant frozen realm where the spirit was trapped by the will of the dark gods. The shaman, desperate to aid her people, readily agreed and was granted the ancient and mystical power of winter itself. With the ancient widow's guidance, the shaman quickly mastered her new and godlike powers and used them to gather what she needed to fulfill her promise. With her willpower and powerful magic, she bound the disparate Gospodor clans into a single unified people and placed herself above them as their first Khan queen, known now forever as Miska the Slaughterer. With her people united and determined, the massive horde of horsemen raced across their now dying homeland, riding all their hardest to escape the darkness that had come to consume them all. After many long years of bloodshed and sacrifice on the endless steppe, the now war-driven people of the Gospodors finally reached the mighty World's Edge Mountains, the final barrier to bar their way from their people's destiny. Once Khan Queen Miska reached the other side, there, wide-eyed, she encountered a vast snow-covered plain, pulsing with mystical icy power. She immediately collapsed to the ground and wept frozen tears, for she knew the search for their people's salvation was finally over. Although the Great Spirit had promised this beautiful snowy paradise to the Gospodors, this land was already claimed by another group of horse-born people. The Ungols of ancient times had lived in this land for centuries, having fought and bled their blood and the blood of their sons to halt the Greenskin menace that invaded the Old World during the reign of Sigmar Heldenhammer. Though peace between the Ungols and Sigmar's people was solidified during the Battle of Blackfire Pass, this peace did not transfer towards these new invaders. Although these were powerful tribes, the people of the Ungols of Kislev, or the Odosis and Ostagoths of the Empire, could not hope to stand in the way of the Gospodor horde that poured out of the north. Under the leadership of Khan Queen Miska, the Gospodors were powerful and wealthy, and possessed an unmatched tactical genius in warfare, their skills in fighting from horseback superior to even that of the Ungols. The Khan Queen was not only a warrior of great skill and courage, but also a sorcerer of unmatched power. Soon, the Ungols were pushed back and scattered, with the Ungols having an everlasting fear of the dreaded Ice Queen forevermore. The Khan Queen continued her march of conquest against the Ungol tribes for several years, eventually leading her host towards the walls and gates of the Ungol Bastion of Prague itself. Although mighty and powerful, the walls of this ancient city were laid low by powerful ice spells of the Khan Queen's magic, forcing the entirety of the Ungol people westward towards their new capital city of Norvad. With the sudden dislocation of their native homeland, the Ungols migrated towards the northwest, forcing their way into Ropsman territory. All previous alliances and treaties between these two people ended when Prague fell, and an Ungol army under the leadership of warlord Heathis Chak defeated a Ropsman host led by their ruler, King Weiran, on the cliffs overlooking the Sea of Claws. With the death of their ruler, the Ropsman tribes were scattered, and the Ungols claimed their former neighbour's land and absorbed the remnants of this once great people. Not content to keep and cultivate the lands that they had earned during their conquest, the Gospodor tribes began to further expand their territories westward until they came into conflict with the provinces of Ostland and Ostermark. Torn with strife and constant warfare during the Age of Three Emperors, the men of the Empire were not strong enough to halt the advance of the Gospodor horsemen as they drove deep into unoccupied territory. Soon much of the northern territories of Ostland were lost, until finally the Gospodors had to halt their advance at the edge of the Forest of Shadows. Though the lands the Gospodors claimed were won back by the military might of the Imperial armies, the status and power of the Gospodors eventually made the Empire consider their claims as a kingdom in their own right. Khan Queen Mishka did not live to see the land that she had begun to forge take shape, 
for she vanished to the north, claiming to have seen a vision of a terrible future where she would once again be needed to lead her people to salvation. Leaving her fearsome magical blade, Fearfrost, to her daughter, Shoika, Mishka gathered her most trusted warriors and rode north, never to return. By the year 1527 IC, the Gospodor tribes under the rulership of their new Khan queen began construction of their great capital city, which they named Kislev, after the land and the kingdom itself. With the city of her people in construction, Shoika removed her previous title as Khan queen and accepted her new title as Tsar to indicate her new reign over the lands north of the Oskoy. Under the new rulership of Tsarina Shoika, the city that was to become Kislev was built, and the realm began to take the shape of the nation that it is today. Having inherited the title as the new Tsarina of Kislev, the Gospodurin calendar and the establishment of the nation of Kislev was founded under her edict. The first act as Tsarina was to march on towards Norvad, the last bastion of Ungol resistance against Gospodor dominance. This mighty trading post on the western coast of Kislev proved to be key in placing Kislev at the forefront of trade with the rest of the world, and Shoika knew that her dreams of a unified nation would not be fulfilled whilst the city was still held in Ungol hands. Leading her host through the open tundra of northern Kislev, her host of warriors began a new campaign to solidify their hold on the northwestern territories. Less than two years after her crowning as Tsarina, Shoika and her host of horsemen eventually besieged and captured the capital city of Norvard, naming it Erengrad in honour of the victory. Those Ungols that survived the bloody siege fled to the north, where they were ruthlessly hunted until their people had no choice but to accept the Gospodor's rule over the land and assimilate into Gospodor society, renegated to the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. With this final act, the birth of their new nation was complete, and in recognition of this, the Gospodor people relinquished their former names and adopted the name of Kislevites, after the name of the land and their capital city. Within a few years, the settlements of Prague and Erengrad were rebuilt and began to grow in size once more. Prague grew rich and powerful due to the large influx of Ungols returning to their once beautiful city to start life anew under Kislevite rulership. Erengrad experienced a huge increase in trade and wealth as the new ports and harbours that were built became some of the busiest trading hubs in the entire Old World. From here, Kislevites were able to sail the Sea of Claws, trading and fighting with the Norse and the Imperials, as well as keeping the few remaining Ungol tribes that refused to submit to their rule in check. This time of great prosperity and happiness lasted for nearly 750 years, and over time, the people of the Gospodors and Ungol bloodline intermingled, creating the society that many would view today as modern Kislev. Although the Ungols and Gospodors now live in tranquil harmony, there is still a large division between them that has shaped the way that Kislev is structured. The ruling elite from whom the Tsar and Tsarina hails are unsurprisingly all of Gospodor heritage, though the influence of their language and beliefs is more evident in the fertile south. Further north, however, where the lands are more barren, the horse tribes still hold sway, and there's been a resurgence in the old ways of life that existed before the coming of the Gospodors. In fact, Prague was reclaimed in a large part by the old Ungol nobility, and in many ways is a separate power in itself in the far north of the country. For generations, the sons of Kislev have fought and died on the barren plains of the far north. Chaos raids against the south are common in a land so close to the chaos waste, and this endless stream of warfare only made the people of this land hardier than those the weaker south, as their chaos molesters followed them to their new homeland and continued to raid them. After years of constant conflict with the northern marauders, successive Tsars and Tsarinas have ordered the establishment of several forts 
occupying the southern end of High Pass and Black Blood Pass, usually garrisoned by several hundred men under the leadership of a March Boyar, to watch for any sign of an upcoming invasion. As the years have gone by, these raids have grown more fearsome and numerous, and the tribes of the Ungol grew uneasy as their hags and shamans foretold a great gathering of powerful eldritch energies in the far north. The power of the Dark Gods began to grow stronger and stronger in the Chaos Waste over the millennium, and war drums were sounded as the armies of the north gathered for the great slaughtering that would succumb. Cold northern winds grew particularly strong, the portents of doom were abound, heralding those with magical insight to see the great storm that was coming to consume them all. On the winter of 2031 IC, a powerful Kurgan chieftain, as of our Kull of the Kull tribe, led a massive invasion force of Chaos Warriors towards the very heart of Kislev itself, heeding the calls of the Dark God with his new title of the Everchosen. When the tribes came south, some called it the Great Slaughtering, the God Calling, the Coming of the Storm, but by those of the weaker southern realms, this invasion was known as the Great War Against Chaos. In response to this, a force of Kislevite and Imperial soldiers was mustered and faced the oncoming hordes just north of the city of Prague, between the towns of Myrmograd and Chazask. The Allied army was unfortunately surrounded and massacred, underestimating the sheer size of Kull's army. Advancing at the western foothills of the World's Edge Mountains, the large Chaos Horde also managed to subsequently destroy a contingent of Kislevites defending the last operational bridge on the River Lysink, and Kull's forces crossed the last barrier between it and the city of Prague. For much of the spring and summer of 2301 IC, the Chaos Army besieged the Ungol city of Prague, the so-called Bastion of the North. For months now, the Chaos Armies under Kull had made daring assaults against the city's walls, but the sheer ferocity of the defenders' courage proved just as fearsome as the Northmen themselves. The city walls stood high and proud, and the city's defenders hurled their attacks time and time again back with desperate heroics and the use of their deadly skills of the bow. But it was not the sword or the axe that proved the downfall of this great city, but one that the Kislevites thought was the greatest of their weapons. In the winter of 2301 IC, starvation began to run wild in the streets of Prague, unable to feed its numerous populace without the produce made by the now destroyed local farms. Though the winter cold killed far more Chaos Warriors than the Kislevites defenders, the meagre defence that the city had left after the season's end proved insufficient to hold the walls. And at the end of winter, Prague had fallen and the Chaos hordes ran amok in its streets. With its downfall, the raw powers of Chaos engulfed the very city, like a never-ending tide of pure mutation that corrupts everything in its path and the Bastion of the North has changed forever. Its survivors were fused together in hellish, inhuman shapes. Living bodies melted into the walls of the city, so that it became impossible to tell flesh from stone. Distorted faces peered from the walls. Agonized limbs writhed from the pavement, and pillars of stone groaned with voices that came from once human throats. Prague had become a living nightmare, and a grim warning of the suffering that lay ahead if the warriors of the Dark Gods were to be victorious elsewhere. Before the downfall of the city, the Tsar at the time, Alexis Romanov, sent a plea for aid against the Chaos Horde that were assailing his gates. The first to heed the call was the Elector Count of Ostland, whose army was subsequently destroyed just north of the city of Prague. Unlike the Elector Count of Ostland, however, the other Elector Counts of the Empire grew terrified, believing that all hope was lost and that the end times were truly to come. Weakened by the age of three emperors and the endless streams of mysterious crop failures, rampant disease and rife mutation amongst the many provinces, hidden chaos cults from all over the Empire had instigated uprisings to further disrupt the Imperial war effort. 
hoping to gain favour from the invaders once the Empire was fallen. One particularly powerful Chaos cult, called the Magi, led the largest of the uprisings, using their powerful Zench sorcerers to summon forth demons and horrors upon the city of Newland. Those who remained loyal to Sigmar prayed for deliverance, receiving an answer in the twin-tailed comet that soared in the night sky. Magnus the Pious saw the comet, and inspired by his grounding in the Church of Sigmar, used his influence as a minor noble to rally the people. Under Magnus's leadership, Newland was liberated from chaos, with Magnus taking up his crusade across the Empire. A massive army was being assembled from the Elector Counts and other powers, either swayed by Magnus's tongue or afraid of any refusal to aid the growing force. It became the largest army ever assembled within the Empire in its long and war-torn history. Eventually, Magnus reached the city of Middenheim, where he sought an audience with R. Ulrich, Christov, to gain support for the war. After Christov denounced Magnus as nothing more than a charlatan, Magnus walked through the sacred flame of Ulrich, a holy site of the Church of Ulrich which separates the pure from the tainted and the truthful from the liar. After miraculously emerging unscathed, Magnus has proven the righteousness of his cause and gained the support of a powerful ally. Magnus tactfully appointed Christov as the leader of his cavalry force. With the aid of Pieter Laszlo, the personal ambassador of Magnus, Teclis, lawmaster of the Tower of Hoeth, also joined Magnus's regime, along with two other very powerful wizards. With his forces ready, the army began to march on towards the north. Knowing that the army was too large to be able to reach Prague on time, Magnus ordered Christov's cavalry force, consisting of vengeful Kislevite winged lancers and glory-hungry knights, to ride with all speed towards the beleaguered city. Night and day, the Imperial and Kislevite horsemen rode to aid their brothers of the north, envisioning great horrors that was to come of the people of Prague if they were too late. However, these horrors and more were revealed to be true the day the army reached the outskirts of Prague. It had fallen just a few short hours before the arrival of the army. From off in the distance, they could hear the screams of dying men, the screeches of butchered women, and the cries of children as their lives went up in flames and bloodshed. The Imperial Army stood quiet and grim on that sorrowful hill, weeping small tears as they watched the last Chaos Army finish up their dirty work. With the fall of the city, several hundred dwarfen warriors from the city of Karaza Karak had marched ceaselessly towards the capital city of Kislev, hoping to aid in its defence. With the last Chaos Army having left the shattered city of Prague, the Imperial Cavalry hunted the rearguard of Azovar Kull's horde, destroying them utterly without Azovar Kull knowing. Magnus, on the other hand, was marching his force towards Kislev as well, hoping to resupply before heading towards Prague, naive of the events that had befallen the city. Upon his arrival in the outskirts, he saw the capital besieged by the Chaos Hordes, with only a few detachments of Kislevites and a contingent of dwarfs desperately fighting to keep the enemy at bay. Seeing the event as dire, Magnus immediately ordered the charge towards the enemy's rear. Surprised by the sudden arrival of the massive Imperial Army and the unstoppable power of Teclis's magic, the Chaos lines began to waver as grim-faced Imperial soldiers drove a wedge deep into the enemy ranks. Just when the Chaos hordes began to buckle under this sudden assault, Azavar Kull rallied his greatest warriors and used their numbers to encircle Magnus' army. The relief force began to get bogged down by the greater number of their enemy, and Magnus was forced into a defensive position as the horde began to close in all around them. On the city's walls, the battle between the forces of Chaos and the Imperial Relief Army was seen by the Kislevite defenders. 300 dwarfs broke out of the city gates in an attempt to try to reach the Imperial Relief Force, but they were beaten back, only half of their number returning to the beleaguered Kislevite capital. When it seemed that all hope was lost to the defenders of the city, 
The Imperial cavalry, which had been sent to relieve fallen Prague, appeared on the northern horizon, on the so-called Hill of Heroes, and launched a devastating attack, born of hatred upon the Cow's Horde. Watching the enemy suddenly broken by the appearance of the Imperial reinforcements, Magnus spurred his men on to one last Herculean effort to relieve the city. Seeing that the forces of order had gained some momentum, the gates of Kislev were opened and the Kislevites and their dwarven allies spilled forth to slam into the army of chaos from yet another flank. Caught between three separate offensives on every side, the chaos horde slowly disintegrated and a mass rout soon ensued. The plains of the city grew thick with Northmen blood and bodies as the Kislevite brought dire hatred upon those that destroyed their beloved homeland. The remnants of the Horde fled back to the north, where they faced the dire punishments of their failures to their gods. The body of Kull, however, was never found. Even as the armies of warriors that would liberate Kislev massacred the last of the Northmen invaders, the damage to the nation was beyond repair. Kislev was in ruins, his population massacred and its cities turned to rubble. For more than a century, this state of affair lasted, with none of the Tsars being able to have enough power, wealth or sense of duty to reconstruct all which their forefathers worked so hard to achieve. Taking advantage of this distraction, all manner of foul creatures took up residence in unoccupied areas of Kislev, killing off those few villagers that survived the initial invasion force and becoming an ever-present threat to those that would leave the comforts of the south lands of humankind. Such things only got worse when one of their own Tsarinas, Katarin the Bloody, became one of the dreaded vampires and orchestrated a secretive and bloody massacre on the population of the city of Kislev that gave her that rightful name. Only the intervention of her very own son, Zarvich Pavel, ended her reign of terror over the land. But even this new Tsar did little to ease the pain of a ruined kingdom, and it was only in the year 2491 IC that a new and true ruler of Kislev stood up to aid his people in this dire time. In the heavily forested woodland areas, just east of Kislev, near the borders of the World's Edge Mountains. The then ruler of Kislev, Vladimir Boka, died fighting goblins that had infested the region since the Chaos invasion several hundred years earlier. This Tsar was the first in his line to actually take up arms and ensure the safety of his people by doing a systemic campaign of purgings throughout the lands of Troll Country, the Northern Oblast, and the eastern woodlands of Kislev. Vladimir's son, Boris Boka, was crowned the next Tsar of Kislev after his father's demise. Boris Boka was a fiery, passionate warrior, and it was said that he was born with the sound of the blood heart howling in the winds above him. A good omen for a warrior of Kislev, and the hags and wise women prophesied that he would fight hard and die well to ensure the safety of his kingdom. Boris continued his father's work for years, emptying the treasures of his own family to hire mercenaries to retrain the Kislevite armies, rebuilding bridges, roads and towns, as well as importing large sums of black powder and imperial engineers from the empire to aid in his wars and massive construction projects. Although it almost bankrupted his family and several other noble families in the bargain, Tsar Boris's reign will forever be remembered for his driving spirit an eagerness to reclaim the lands that had become the domains of goblins, trolls, beastmen, and other foul things. During his first few years as Tsar, Boris and his family of highly trained Kislevite warriors had also beaten a beastman horde in the outskirts of Prague, earning Boris his title as the Red, a testimony to the gruesome massacre that had unfolded upon the beastman host. Tsar Boris was also instrumental in the revival of the cult of Urson, the original religion of the Gospodor people, from which they had slowly been overtaken by the worship of Ulrich, Tal, and other foreign gods. To do so, he undertook a trial of initiation that the priest of Urson must overcome to join the order. 
and went to the forest to tame himself a bear. He was not seen or heard of for eighteen days, and many feared that he had met a gruesome fate in the depths of the icy forest. Preparations even began for the coronation of his infant daughter Catherine. When search parties came across his unconscious form in the nineteenth day of the search, his still body was guarded by a bear of monstrous proportions, and the beast would not let anyone near him. The Tsar was also surrounded by the corpse of two dozen massive wolves, and the snow was red with their blood. Nothing the searchers could do would entice the bear away from their ruler, or convince it that they meant no harm. Finally, another day had passed. Boris awoke, and the bear allowed the searchers to approach and tend to their ruler's wounds. The tale of Boris turned to folklore upon his return to the city of Kislev, although few doubt the truth of it. Four days before being found by the searchers, and after much wandering, he came across the mightiest bear that he had ever seen, with teeth and claws like sabre blades, and muscles that bulged with wiry veins. Taking this as a sign from Urson, he had confronted the beast, and it charged him, the ground shaking with the fury of its charge, and a blood-curdling roar echoing throughout the forest. With his bare hands, he had fended off the creature's attacks, but could not overpower it. The struggle lasted a full day before a massive wolf pack, drawn by the scent of their combined blood, attacked. The wolves immediately went for the bear, but Boris sprang to its aid, crushing the skulls of the wolves with his fists and tearing them from his back. Boris was badly wounded during the fighting, and the Tsar fell to his knees and shrank to the ground, unconscious. As the rest of the wolves closed in for the kill, the bear protected his former enemy from the common foe. It stood over the supine Tsar, tearing the wolves apart with its claws and savaging them with its powerful jaws. Boris had slipped unconscious, yet each time he had drifted awake, the bear had been there, protecting him from the wolves. After being found, the bear returned to Kislev with the Tsar, and from then on, Whenever Boris took to the field of battle, it was atop the back of his mighty companion Erskine, meaning Bear Brother. Both a symbol of Urson's power and affection for Boris, and an implacable enemy in battle. In the year 2517 IC, after much campaigning and purging in the northern oblast of Kislev, the once mighty Tsar fell at a battle near the borders of Troll Country, whilst leading a regiment of Kislevite horsemen. At an unnamed river crossing, the Tsar charged deep into the Kurgan army of Hetzar Freyaj, but was soon surrounded and cut off from the rest of his army. He and Erskine fought with all the might and fury of the Bear God, but even Red Boris could not triumph against such odds. Erskine was able to fight his way clear of the Kurgans, and carry the Tsar back to the rest of the army, but it was too late. The Tsar had taken a score of mortal and lethal wounds. Only when the battle was won did the Tsar slide from the back of Erskine, and die in the cold hard ground of Kislevite Oblast. The army of Kislev were gasp and mourned his passing, whilst his faithful companion Erskine roared in mourning for a full night before vanishing into the bleak Northlands. And legend has it that to this day, Erskine continues to hunt down the creatures of chaos that slew his master. With the death of Tsar Boris, the now fully grown Katarin became the new Tsarina of Kislev, the latest in a long line of rulers descended from the ancient Khan Queen of the Gospodors. She rules with a cold majesty, beloved by her subjects and feared by her enemies. But barely four years into her reign, the land began to shake as the drums of war echo throughout the lands of the north, as the greatest invasion since the time of the great war against chaos will forever decide the fate of her new kingdom. The end times has begun.
Here's one for you guys. How did Boris know what the bear was doing while he was passed out? Was that all a big propaganda story? Comment below.